what's going on strange gang it's your man dr strange and we are here on the block with none other than cryptoids ceo will wine rob how you feeling my brother i'm good brother thank you for having me i'm excited to be here absolutely absolutely block is glad hot. to have you yes yes the block <laughs> is hot so you know we gotta we gotta get in and get out you know keep it moving Mm -hmm. So yeah, man. Oh, this is a long time coming. Will, um, I'm glad you got the memo. Gray hoodie, gray right. hoodie season. Come proper, <laughs> man. Couldn't have planned it any better, even though we didn't plan it. You know, so hundred percent. So how you feel? Yes, there, man? I see your hat. Oh. The Giants they won today. No, hey, you know what I'm saying. I'll take the little win, man. You know we ain't going nowhere this year, so I'll take these little wins as I get up. <laughs> They got my, dad was actually, my dad's a Giants fan, so he was rooting for the Giants today. Um, okay, okay. Yeah. So he was a little excited. He was super know. excited. He was here. He just came in. He just drove down. So he just he, he came in right in time for the game, and he was on my back deck, like, screaming like crazy. You know, Saquon <laughs> caught a little, like, touchdown pass, and he yeah. loves this kid, DeVito. He loves, like, the story behind DeVito. Yeah. Like, it's like an underdog story, you know, went to Syracuse, got transferred. So he was telling me all about him. So, wow. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know too much about this. Uh, I believe he's like a third stringer because right. we had Daniel Jones and Tyrod Taylor. Mm -hmm. And now we got DeVito with the helm, man. Can you fill me in on uh, what he told you about him? All I know is it's like kind of like a, a Cinderella story. Like uh, he was local kid, you know, in like New Jersey uh went to syracuse i believe and again i'm if this is all false like you know don't come at me in the comments i'm just <laughs> hearing over hearing yeah. my dad kind of ramble about it a little bit i think he said he went to syracuse um and then didn't work out at syracuse so he transferred to illinois and illinois was just like not really a, a great team or super relevant in like the the, the collegiate uh, you know uh you know in d1 uh football right, exactly right. um and then he just kind of bounced around and you know it was like a journeyman quarterback and you know has always been this new jersey guy you know last name is devito you know so like <laughs> i mean doesn't get any more jersey than that exactly right so um i think it's just like a hometown kid like against all odds playing in the nfl i think that's kind of the, the vibe yeah can you imagine and then ending up on your hometown team like that man i know and and, and i don't know if it's 100 percent accurate but like my dad told me that he's actually still living with his parents in new jersey and like wow. you know it's like you know probably, he's probably going after the game and go getting like a like a chicken parmesan right at the, the, <laughs> the, the you know the corner italian restaurant there in jersey you know <laughs> you know that <laughs> You know that. Let me get a slice like, on know, the everyday side. Folk, everyday folk like us, you know? Right. Yo, that's wild, man. Um, man, that adds a little bit of extra flavor to, to him being the starter now. And um, I was already rooting for him. You know, I'm yeah. kind of like one of those people that roots for the underdogs anyway. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, this is going to make me want to dig in a little bit more. And, I mean, we got – you know, a couple weeks left in this season, and um, he's gonna have to ride it out as long as he stays healthy. So mm -hmm. let's see what he got. You know, I've been talking to friends, and they're like, they were all, all down and out. I forgot. I think we played like the Cowboys or something and got destroyed. And yeah, yeah like, national team. Know. Right. And I don't know about that. I'm like, he's a rookie, man. What do you expect? <laughs> like, you know, and it's, he's only been with the team a couple of weeks, man. Let him cook. You know? Yeah. So you never know where these things go, and you know, it, it seems that people who have these type of like Cinderella type stories, you know, that they they tend to elevate most of the time. And they did this highly motivated. And I mean, to be playing for your hometown team and he's, he's taking it personal, taking it serious and um, much respect and good luck to him and my G men. But let's let's get to your team. Who, who exactly is your favorite team? Oh yeah, Miami Dolphins, baby! This is my squad. I love it. I love it. I um, love it. Yeah, I love the and and I this is this is my hometown team. I've been rooting for the Dolphins ever since I'm a little kid. Uh, I now wow. split my time between Miami and Charlotte. So when I have an NFC team, I root for the Panthers. They're absolutely terrible this year. Um, but this is my my number one team uh, is the Miami Dolphins. I got just tons of Dolphins gear. I've, I've grown up a, a Fins fan, and it's just been. 
a miserable existence for the past, you know, 20 something years, you know, ever since Dan Marino days, um, uh-huh. you know, the Marino days were like the heyday and like we had this great quarterback and then, you know, Marino retired and it's been like a quarterback carousel for the past 20 years. And it's just been just crappy season after crappy season. And you just get used to it. You get kind of numb to it as a, uh, as a Finns fan. Um, and they're always the underdog. And, you know, we always said as a Finns fan, we just find a quarterback. We just find a quarterback. And then, mm-hmm. you know, we drafted Tua, um, mm-hmm. you know, a few years ago. And it was one of those things where Tua didn't look like he was panning out early on. But according to Tua, it was really, you know, now you kind of see him flourish after the change from Brian Flores to Mike McDaniel. And it just goes to show you, just how important like the scheme and the situation is for these players like huge you would think like imagine like patrick mahomes if he got drafted by like the jets or the exactly. lions you know exactly right? exactly like would he be patrick mahomes he just so happened to go to andy reed and the perfect system for his skill set right? right so you know like I, I just think it was one of those things he needed a couple years to like get familiar with the nfl but then he found a guy that really gave him the confidence to to like be himself and he he said it in a in a recent press conference he said you know when brian flores was the coach he didn't even want to talk back he just said yes sir no sir when brian flores would talk right. to him he was just like imposing yeah. he was just he like, is telling, he's a very yeah. telling tua what to do specifically and tua you know he's a rook and a sophomore in you know, his second year and he's just like yes sir no sir right. and then mcdaniels right. came in and mcdaniels said this is a two-way conversation He's like, mm. I want to hear your ideas. I want to hear your play calls and, and your scheme ideas. I want to be in the room with you and collaborate. And I thought that was like a great example of like, you know, a sports lesson that you could take into building businesses as well. Because as a leader of a company, you don't want to go in and be like, this is the way we're doing it. Follow my lead. This is how we're going to do this. Is the, this, is, this is the rules. This is the playbook. This is the strategy. Like you can't really build a team around that culture. What you need to do is empower people, right, to make sure that they come with their ideas, that they can feel like they can play offense, that they feel like they're creative, that they're firing on all cylinders. And, um, you know, I think, you know, as a leader of a business, you really want to make sure your team is fully empowered to speak their mind. And, you know, when Tua said that, I thought, what what a great lesson to bring in for, for building companies as well, not just for sports. So. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely, man. Um, you know, <clears throat> I can definitely relate to how you feel. Also, yeah. you know, having the two teams, AFC, NFC. So yeah. got my Giants, I got my Jets. Mm-hmm. And being a Jets fan, oh boy, you know, the, the, the things we've been through. I don't want to make you spit up your coffee, man. But um, yeah, same thing. And then I have friends um native to new york but they were dolphin fans i'm like how could you you know and then when we play each other you know it's that stuff going on but deep down inside man i'm a dolphins fan too because i love Mm. marino in the 80s and oh man that was just and i love the colors too you know what i mean i I don't know this is the colors yeah it's fire man aqua and orange and you know especially the retro like the deeper aqua it's it's very 80s you know yeah, yeah, I got like that not white but off white tinge to it. You totally. know what I mean? Um, I used I got to. A I, remember. Of, uh, I got a sick pair of Asics. Uh, that it's like Ronnie Feig. You know about Ronnie Feig and like he's also from 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 New York. You know he's Kith. He's the you know the the designer and the owner of the streetwear brand Kith, and mm-hmm. um, and he made a pair of Asics. That's how he got his big break. Was Asics allowed him to collaborate and do all these different crazy colorways? And he has a wow. sick Asics gel re- gel light three in the, the mm. that exact color scheme: the white, aqua, and orange. And when um, I, I, I gave myself a a present last year, I bought myself a present when uh, you know when when I hit a milestone with the company, and I treated myself to that pair. I wanted that specific pair. <laughs> Uh, right, so I'll have to to, nice. to rock them. Hopefully, when the Dolphins go to the Super Bowl, I'll rock them at the Super Bowl. Yeah, man. Yeah, I I, I feel like their time is definitely coming. Um, it's uh, funny when you mentioned Tua, man, because I'm a you know avid sport car collector, comic book collector, all of that stuff. So, mm-hmm. um, you know how rabid things were, you know, a year or two ago, and yeah. everything's going crazy, and you know. 
I used to go into Walmart or wherever and buy a blaster box and it was like a ghost town. I can get as many as I want. Mm -hmm. And then once the pandemic hit, it, it became business in itself with, yeah. with all of that stuff. And oh, yeah. um, I remember seeing Tua uh, in college and then I always watched the draft and something told me like, there's something special about this guy. You know, I, I really like to get deep into the draft and, and figure out who these players are early because um, not only do I like to collect and kind of be ahead of the curve, but I'm also an avid daily fantasy sports player. Um, and I just recently got into like prop bets type of things and stuff like that. So you got to really stay in tune with what's going on around the league and everything. And man, I collected so many tour cards when people were writing him off i was getting Good. you know pr prism blacks yeah. you know one of fives and i just collect I'm going harder and harder the more that if i evaluate somebody and i deem them to be a good player something to collect you know i'm not going to let one injury necessarily and, and bad coaching or just not being the right atmosphere and environment for the player i'm not just going to write them off because I can envision exactly what happened happening. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Um, when the organization goes all out on a player like that and he's super talented and they can see that his growth is being stunted by the leadership, they're going to be the first ones to go, not the guy you just drafted. 100%. So I said, okay, if, if they're smart, they're going to get the right leadership. And I think the offensive coordinator was the first that they had let go before the head coach. I'm not sure, though. Um, but once I saw that domino fall, I kind of knew what was up and I said, man, if this kid rehab strong and I knew Miami, most of Florida has great rehab um, programs aligned with their um, mm -hmm. organizations. Yes. So whether you're talking Jags, um, Tampa he, Bay Buck, he, he, the he, right, they're, they're known for this stuff. So I mm -hmm. said, man, this kid's going to come back like a raging machine. I never envisioned him getting Tyreek Hill, but once that yeah. happened, I doubled down on my collection. I'm like, That's oh, right. I give me more to it before it goes up, man. So right yeah. now my, my cards are doing a little bit better in the market. That's um, awesome. So, yeah, I can't be mad at that, man. I got a, I got a, a, a decent to a bag as well, uh, just as a Dolphins fan. I told myself, and this was right as, you know, everything was starting to pick back up with sports cards. And I, I fell deep into the rabbit hole because, you know, we're just collectors in general, right? Like we love all the collecting stuff, like whether it's Funkos or comics or toys or cards or whatever. We're just into that. And um, I thought, oh, my God, when is the, the Dolphins have never had a first round like rookie, like top tier prospect like this, a quarterback before, you know, with football cards. <laughs> With football cards, really the quarterbacks are where it's at with football cards. Yes. Like the wide receivers and stuff, like it's really hard. Like even even like a Justin Jefferson or like somebody who's like top of the game right now, like there's, a, there's, a, cap, there's a cap to those, you know, the is. values of those. It's really where the, the quarterbacks is. are really where the value is. Yes. So it's just like, you know what? The Dolphins finally, they have like a, a sick prospect, a quarterback. I'm going hard into the, the two RPAs. And that's what really what I was chasing was RPAs, you know? Nice. Uh, for, for those of you, your viewers that don't know what that means, it stands for Rookie Patch Auto. Patch auto. So it's the, the rookie card, it's a patch of their jersey or the logo. Uh, and then it's an autograph. And uh, I, I got a few Tua cards that were just autographs. And then... I fell into those. Oh, that's an autograph, but that's not an on-card auto. It's a sticker auto. Oh, I need an on-card oh, auto. And then, I got, I then, I got, then I got, oh, man, I got to get two on-card autos. And then, oh, no, but now I got to get two on-card autos with a patch. And you just like. <laughs> and then you, numbered. Numbered. And then oh, you got to get the number. Right. One to five. One to 25. 100%. Which, oh, Lord. It's a never-ending rabbit hole, really, you know. Yep. And I think it's sad, like you said, that you just players don't get as much love in the market and especially the wide receivers even the running backs you know i would love to have invested in saquon and different people mm -hmm. but it's like step back you zoom out and you look at the market it's like man you know you gotta really be part of that like top five percent really at have the to. End to, to you know, for the cars to hold value, you know. Yeah, because if you look at like them. even like the Barry Sanders and the Jerry Rice stuff, it's like Jerry Rice, right? You know, that's like probably as best as you're gonna get with like you know rookie cards, and and those still have a, a ceiling to them. You know? A ceiling, right? Yeah. Right. It, it it's ah, oh, it's sad, man. You know, yeah. I I believe you know even the, the defensive players like your Sauce Gardners and 
yeah. all these different guys that have a name they should they should their cars should have more value than they do and uh who knows where this market's gonna go but that just seems to be the trend right it's qbs totally. or nothing it feels like man. and i just started buying stuff that i like like um that for me was like the real chase at that point i was like all right you know what i got a few two was and like for me like let's play and hopefully it hits and they'll, they'll be worth something but i started saying you know what i want a tim hardaway miami heat auto because i loved Ooh. tim hardaway growing up yes, playing for yes. the miami heat and i didn't get his his rookie i just got you know there was like a a, a version of national treasures or or, or yes. you know or flawless that had a, a retro of Tim Hardaway on the heat with his on card auto. And I went on eBay and I found one for like 15 bucks because it wasn't a wow. year. And I'm like, you know what? I just think that looks dope and I want that in my case. So then exactly. I was like, then I was like, you know what? Fine. I want a Zoe and I want a Chris Bosch RPA, but no, I'm sorry, a Chris, a Chris Bosch uh, patch auto, not a rookie, but just him on the heat with a patch and auto. I got that one for like 50 bucks, but it looks dope. You know, Chris Bosch exactly. with the patch and the auto and like, I get so much joy going over to my case and just looking at the collection. I don't have to worry about like, oh, what's that worth? I just like, yo, exactly. there's Bosch, there's Timmy. I got Shane Battier. I got, Ooh. you know, like all these like, you know, role player heat, but like from that run that I just like think are awesome cards, you know? You got any Haslam in the connect in the hold collection? On. Hold on, I'll go get I'll go Come get on, it. go with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. Minute. So Udonis. Yeah, see, I had to test him, y'all. I had to test him. I mean, that man has a ridiculous tenure with that team, man. So I'm like, any real Heat fan that understands the amount of work that guy put in, they have to have him in the collection. You know what I'm saying? If for nothing else, sentimental value, you know? So I'm not shocked. I'm not shocked that he had. That's why I had to pull it. Listen, I'm not surprised that he has a Udonis in the stash at all so let's see what he got y'all all right i just brought my case over so i'm gonna have to you give me a minute yeah. while I let's go get some show stuff. and tell so, pop in here so first i guess i'll show you the two us because we talked about the two us right let's get it let's get it once again guys we here we just chilling on the block man this is what we do on the block you know we just chill out and bob so, so the first one that i got i started looking at this was a a specter you know just a rookie I actually, you know yes i have that i have this that one, right? i don't know <laughs> yeah, if this one's number this is number 20 to 75 this one in particular okay. and then i was like all right that one's dope but then you can get a a variant like a like i don't know what they call it but like there's like a another parallel to it you know parallel, like, right. right and nice. this one is 12 out of 30. a same same set but just a little bit of a higher variant and then i was like all right i saw a sick one on ebay so i sniped it and this was a, an rpa right um Ooh, or tri-color yeah tri-color patch i was like <laughs> that's a sick patch all three colors and i love uh, origins yeah, Origins is dope set, and this is 48 out of 49. But then I was like, oh, then I learned, oh, that's a sticker auto. All right. So I said, all oh, right, well, yeah. you got to come correct on one. Yeah, right. yeah. So this was my big splurge. So this was, um, let's see. So this is from the Immaculate set to wow. a RPA on card on card number. 214 with the not just the patch but the actual uh logo logo right and right. it's that's a four color patch so that yeah, that's it. hard to get right there that's hard that's yeah. hard so that's orange you know teal um uh white and blue from the dolphin right so right for me that was my big split so this is like my big like hold on to a, take us to the super bowl right uh, kind of thing you know that's right, one for right. so then um got a bunch of stuff for the heat so like i told you right like let me show you my guy you know timmy right tim oh, hardaway yeah. Ooh. Exactly. Like that's a nice. card right like like to this yeah. like on this this was like 15 bucks on ebay wow. but for me this shit is just so dope like i just love it's sick, man. 
one. I love this car. You know what? You see, you making me want to go back and get like a Penny Hardaway on Orlando right. joint right That's now. The, you like, know, just to like look at. You know what I mean? It's not about the yeah. value or whatever. It's just no. like you know. I just I think this is an awesome card. It's on Card Auto. Um, right. It's 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 one of 125. Like it's not like anything like crazy crazy, but I just right. love it. And this is another one. This is from Immaculate. Um, so it's a modern card, but it's a retro done of Timmy on the heat, and it's got this like depth effect to it. You can see, yeah, like, see that. yeah. yes. I just think it, I just think it's so That's sick. Wild. And I that just love Timmy, bro. Like I, as I grew up watching the Heat, and he would just you know just dribble down the court and just stop and pop, top of the key, right in yep. people's faces. It was just yep. the best. Yeah, um, yeah. That's who I got that from as a kid on the court. <laughs> it was yeah. Timmy. This is an example. Another example. This was the Bosch that I was telling you about, right? Mm-hmm. You know, not a rookie, but just a patch mm-hmm. auto of Bosch, like a sick picture of Bosch with like a, a, a huge piece of the the Miami. Uh, yeah, that's know, the M right there. there, right? Yeah. So I just see another one that I loved. And then mm-hmm. you asked about UD. Of course. Yeah. So had to get UD. Um, had to. You know, of course, he's Mr. Miami, he's Mr. 305. So, so I got a, uh, you know, this is, this one's not a rookie. This is a, um, just like a, a veteran card, an on card uh, of, of Udonis, but I had to have him in the, in the case. And then um, this one is the, the, the RPA. This is not RPA, this is a rookie auto. So uh, this one is, I think, oh. one of, uh, from his rookie year. This is one of, uh, 1250. This is when they were just printing a ton of this stuff, you know? Right, right. This is an upper deck, you know? Yeah, see, <laughs> that's that arrow right there. Yeah. yeah. So, but I think it's so sick. Again, now, this is not worth a lot of money, but to me, it's just dope. You know, it's, it's Udonis, it's his rookie, it's his autograph. And then, like, I hey, think, man. Who's going to care about Shane Battier, the role player? But I, I care about Shane Battier, the role player. Right. And he, you know what right. I mean? Like, I definitely I remember them. These, they're so sick. And then I got some Tyler Heroes. I got some Tyler Hero RPAs there. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, like any, like, any LeBrons from when he was on the Heat? Any LeBrons? Uh, so I don't have, well, do I have a LeBron Heat? Got some bands. I don't have a LeBron Heat. I do have a green. Uh, Auto, um, but not a rookie uh, autograph, but still Ooh. just a dope card, dope pick. You know, I thought this awesome man. pick was made. That's, so. that's a nice one, man. It's a nice one, right? That's a nice one. Well, again, this yeah. is one of those where like, what is this worth? 50 bucks to me worth a lot more, you know? So. Exactly. And he did, uh, a, he did a really nice auto on that as well. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, so, yeah, you know, it's like, look, with random stuff, like, I, I'm going super deep now. This is Jeff Conine on the, uh, you know, on the Florida Marlins. To Marlins. most people, to 99% of people, they don't even know who he is or care about him. But this is Mr. Marlin to me. And my dad took me to watch my first Marlin game. This was the guy on, on wow. the Marlins. So for me, it's more sentimental than anything else. I got this, what, for like maybe 10 bucks on eBay. But right. that, that's why collecting so awesome. You know what I mean? Like. It's in the eye of the beholder. Like somebody's like, oh, Jeff Conine, 10 bucks. And then there's a guy like me on the other, like, oh my God, Jeff Conine for 10 bucks. Only 10 bucks, right. You know? know? (laughs) I'm in the same boat, man. And that's the beauty of it. You know, it's like you said, the value itself is in the eye of the the beholder, you know? Man, you're taking me back on memory lane. So let's stay there, man. Um, Personally, (laughs) I was born in Queens, Jamaica, Queens, New York. Grew up in Suffolk County, Long Island, specifically Central Life Slip, you know, slash Brentwood, home of EPMD, Craig Mack, Biz Marquee. I mean, I had all these people around me growing up, man. It was a crazy, crazy childhood, you know, um, 80s kid, you know. So where did you grow up? I grew up on uh, Miami Beach. Yeah. So Miami kid through and through. Um, and uh you know, just that's get, always got immersed into that city. And, you know, it was, it's been a big part of my life ever since. Um, and, you know, as a kid, you know, you, you, you grow up, you go to Jewish school, everybody, uh, even the white Jewish kids were just into hip hop, 
you know in a big way like everyone was just into the hip-hop culture this was you know i think 93 ish is when 93 so i was born in 85 so 93 i was eight years old mm-hmm. and that's when i remember really like diving head first into music um mm-hmm. you know the first so it was like it was i had like a, a two-way two parallel streets with music the first was like alternative rock and the other was hip-hop so i was always been on like one rock side and one hip-hop side and for for the rock right. side it was always like things like green day and and stuff like yeah. that duke duke had just came out which was like a major album for green day um mtv was like just getting going in its heyday with like yo mtv raps and then they had headbangers ball and all that yes. stuff so i was like you know i'd come home and i just like sit in front of the tv and watch this stuff they also had something in uh, in miami i don't know if they had it up by you it was called the box and with the box oh, yeah was, you had the box so oh, yeah. the box was like you would dial a 1-900 number and like there would be all these like codes scrolling at the bottom of the screen and you can like dj and request for like 3.99 what the yes. next music video was so for me i was just like hooked and the, I, all days when you when i came home from school so i like had to go to dinner you know was mtv in the box straight up mm-hmm. and just watch so the video sick. and stuff and this is when <laughs> You know um you know tupac you know just like getting really into tupac um all eyes on me and uh and then you know with with biggie ready to die and like all these like incredible incredible albums uh so felt you know deeply into the whole death row versus bad boy saga and that was really like my foray into hip-hop was that you know and getting that like i remember getting death row's greatest hits like that double cd you know which one i'm talking about yeah oh yeah um and i just i just started loving that whole rivalry and the whole feud and just you know learning about east coast rap versus west coast rap and discovering the different artists on the different coasts um and then uh and then also uh you know learning Wait, about... don't go too deep don't go too deep bro. you you already man you're just taking away all my questions man this is just... ah man so yeah. i got a couple on the side here you know we just gonna flow into it yeah. But I want to stay in the, in the early. I want to. I want to go back to a time we talking little, little Will, young yeah. Will. If I was like a neighbor of yours, and I was mm-hmm. like peeking out the window, like damn, these kids are making all this noise. You know, I look outside. What would I see young Will doing? Would you like be riding a bike with the BMX crew? Would you just be generally playing with friends, playing basketball, mm-hmm. football, skateboarding? Like, what was your thing as far as when you went outside? And, he was chilling it was basketball basketball all day long it was like that was my favorite sport just you know i had a hoop in my backyard um and we'd be playing basketball uh as much as we could that was the main sport got into skateboarding rollerblading was a big deal in the mid 90s um yes. and i like the you remember like the the rollerblading was actually like you, you would actually there wouldn't be breaks like recreational rollerblades there'd be grinding and the in like you know the, the i forget what they call it but in the middle there'd be an opening so you can grind on pipes and things like that people were doing like sick mm-hmm. tricks with rollerblading so we got into that a little bit the whole skater culture you know got through my air walk phase and the vans phase and all that stuff and uh through all the jenkos own probably like 10 pairs of jenkos uh and then yeah basketball i would think if you were looking out you'd see me do a lot of basketball uh it, you know around miami that was always what would be my friends would do in our spare time okay okay yeah. so i remember you know you said you had alternative rock on one block and then mm-hmm. hip-hop on another block but what was if you had to choose what would you say was your favorite music genre at that time it's hard to say so, so so what happened was i i, I fell in love with those two sides of music through mainstream artists so like i said on the hip-hop side it was like tupac and biggie and then on the rock side it were things like nirvana green day etc foo fighters and all that stuff and then i really then i really decided like to go deeper on both genres and saying like what are like the deep cuts like forget about the stuff that everybody knows all this like mainstream stuff that's on the radio which i love uh, you know i kind of i love all that stuff but then started to really dive into these more independent artists um you know i i I started to 
hang around more with my friends who were in rock bands and they would, you know, make their own music. I would see, you know, some of my friends also start to, to rap on the side and freestyle on the side. And I said, well, if my friends are these amazing independent artists and they're, they're making their own stuff, I want to hear like other independent artists. And like, you know, my friends would say like, oh, check out this guy. I'm influenced by this guy, etc." So I, uh, I started getting deeper into, you know, both genres and on the rock side, I really fell in love with, uh, with punk music, like Southern California punk music, like No Effects, Lag Wagon, stuff like that. Uh, fat records that are based out of California. Just I just kind of fell in love with that music, and that was kind of part of like skater culture growing up. And yes. then also at the same time, I started learning about underground hip hop, and underground hip hop was was something that I was really captivated by because I've always been uh, a creative writer. You know, I, I majored in communications and writing and liberal arts, and I just love the the poetry side of hip hop. And I always thought that uh, these underground hip hop artists that I started to discover, it really blended more so on the side or lean more on the side of poetry. So exactly the first one that was like the fusion of rock and hip hop that really captivated me and really took me to the next level was Gorillaz and Gorillaz has a song called Clint Eastwood and mm -hmm. if you listen to Clint Eastwood, which everybody knows that song. If you play it, you know, you've heard on the radio a hundred oh, times, yeah. you hear this rapper, you know, mm -hmm. um, and you know who that is. Yeah. Drops a sick <laughs> verse. And, you know, I, I, I didn't think of him, but oh my God, who is this guy? And my buddy tells me, oh, his name's Dell, uh, Dell the Funky Homo Sapien. And I'm like, oh, he does he just rap with gorillas? He's like, no, no, no. He's got his own albums and stuff. He's friends with gorillas. So he like he comes on their tracks and he does verses, but he's got his, his you know, his own thing. He's actually Ice Cube's cousin. <laughs> he's so, part of a group called Hyro. And right. so that's just went down thing, a rabbit hole. That's how the whole thing started. So by the way, your folks that don't let's see behind me here. Um, this was a custom piece of art that was done for me. You can't really see at the top here, but this is a vinyl record uh, at the top. And then this three-eyed symbol, this is the symbol for hieroglyphics. This right. uh, symbol here is uh, is Bad Astronaut. It's like an astronaut cartoon. It's one of my favorite punk groups called crazy. Lagwagon, the same lead singer of that band to the side group called Bad Astronaut. And then this guy, I'm gonna turn for a second. I got MF Doom right there. Nice, nice. So there's Doom, right? For it's those of you that know cool. MF Doom. So, oh, yeah. so I just fell down the rabbit hole. So, so, so really it was Dell that really took me down the rabbit hole. And I was like, what else? Oh, yeah. I need to hear all of this, those other discographies and all this stuff. And I just started buying all of his albums. You know, this is when it was, you know, you would have to go to the CD store and the record store and hunt them down. And then the other ones oh, you yeah. find, you'd go on eBay. And then maybe- Comic collectors. Oh, no, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so like, through. And then, like, I got really deep into it. There was one album called Future Development, and there was it was like a, a limited edition, like Japanese only release on vinyl that that he did a cut. It was like a special pressing that was only released in like Japan, or so my friend told me. So then it became a thing: How do I get this pressing? How do I get this vinyl? Because I wanted to hear all of Dell's stuff, and I just thought Dell, his his lyrics were incredible. I just I just thought man i need to find more hip-hop that's like this and that led me to aesop rock um right and aesop rock uh new york based you know dell's based out of oakland california hieroglyphics based out of oakland, california but aesop rocks a new york based rapper um mm -hmm. from def jux uh definitive jux and i was blown away by aesop rock because aesop this rock's got this like abstract style of rapping that doesn't even sound like it rhymes the first time you hear it but then like the second or the third listen you kind of hear yeah, yeah. how he puts together these different rhymes and it just blows your mind um and this was a quick deep, story yeah and this quick was a story. Deep, this was a yeah story so, so this was i, a I got a quick story oh you do for, oh for oh, yeah. yeah so <clears throat> back in my heyday when mm -hmm. i was running around the streets in new york and me and my group the lensman were making a name for ourselves we got with um, well, I went to Sto Stony, not Stony Brook, SUNY College mm -hmm. of Old Westbury, and I dormed there. But at the same time, 
I had a partner and we were a rap group called Blind Chemistry. And a friend of ours we went to high school with, he was a really good DJ, incredible. And he used to make beats, but this was in an era before equipment and all this stuff. So this guy would like make loops from mm -hmm. record and use two, you know, a double cassette deck Mm -hmm. and would kind of record and pause and make extended beats from that and we started making demos in his house around 92 93 and uh senior year after i graduated he called me over the summer and he's like yo i'm about to be the dj of this underground hip-hop radio station it's at adelphi university it's 90.3 i think you and your partner you know we were all friends he was like you should come up here as a group you know you guys you guys are ready you know so we did that and um it was a really crazy crazy experience we just totally destroyed it and um the host of the show his name was drew spence he was like yo you guys are crazy he was like um if you want a copy of the show he was like i live in long island too you know back out east and he lived in north babylon and mm -hmm. we were a couple of towns further like i said in central Islip brentwood area so we went back to you know his house to get a copy of the show and everything he's like not a lot of people know this but i rhyme too he was like i just don't tell people because i'm so i'm just really different so we're mm -hmm. like all right well, how different can you be so he spit for us and we're like this guy is sick like you would never even think because he said i don't know if you're familiar with star and buck wild mm -hmm. but if you know about star star if you didn't if you didn't visually see him you would think he's a white dude mm -hmm. like he's very articulate very well spoken just a steward of the english language he doesn't really use a lot of slang here and there you know so if you're hearing my friend drew over the radio you might think he's a white dude but he's not so when he raps though it's in that same vein you know and mm -hmm. um we just was like yo this guy's crazy he had a little bit of equipment and we had another friend too that was back in ci but he was really cool but when it came to rhyming he kind of sucked mm -hmm. so it was one of those things where it's like yo you know we're gonna go over drew's house you can come with us you know we're all friends whatever but with the rapping stuff just just you know sit to the side a little bit so um we started recording demos and little did we know that the fourth guy was just soaking it all in and i mean it was literally overnight this guy just uh switch flicked on and this guy had the voice of like rock from ogc mm -hmm. um but again just a very different style and i mean i came up in the era i came up in the 80s where yeah. if you literally said another rhyme or your bar ended the same way as someone else they called you a fighter mm. that's what you get labeled a fighter you know <laughs> so i came up in that era where you had to be yourself your name had to be original your style content your bar everything so in that same vein that's what kind of led us to just be an individuals but somehow it all worked because mm. it was like you know our recording and things came together as a group mm -hmm. and um that's you know pretty much how we formed the lensman so quick story um i would say a year maybe like half a year right after 94 i went away to college i went away to old westbury and um my friend drew on the radio he had a bunch of uh, different people i mean everyone from ll keith murray to a lot of just local underground artists would either call up to the show or physically go up to the show. So um, great experience. But what ended up happening was he had a group up there called um, EBS. And then they also changed their name into the Adams family. And basically, you know, we had company flows. We had the juggernauts, the pumpkin heads, the R rugged mans. We had all these people. Yeah. It was just so many dope and flow, and that's that really led to Def Jux, right? It did. There you go. Yeah. So what happened was was the Adams fam itself was an over 100 man crew. Mm -hmm. So we didn't notice at first. It was just a group that my friend Cryptic One has started. And it just blew up because you had a lot of nice MCs from Spring Valley, Westchester, Long Island, you know, of course, the boroughs, too. But they were more or less like a group of just it was just a massive group of people. So I remember, um, you know, us as the Lensman, we were a four man group and Cryptic One. He had a, a, another a bandmate named Just One Art. And it was funny because 
they came up there as a group to the radio show. And by this time, I started co-hosting the show. There was a female co-host at first, and she actually got a spinoff show. So our show was called The M Train. And mm-hmm. then she ended up getting a spinoff show. And I was just, you know, I, I literally was maybe 20 minutes to half an hour from my school to where that school was. So my friend, the host, would just invite me up. And then um, we were hanging out in his studio so much that I started you know, pre-producing the show and coming up with different segments. This is right before Hot 97 came in the mix. And uh, Hot 97 and Angie Martinez actually stole a couple of our segments. That's how crazy Mm -hmm. our show was. Um, So she did something. um, It doesn't matter. But anyway, so the way this all started with getting agreciated with all these different groups was Cryptic One, Jess Von Art, and a couple of artists came up to the radio show did their thing. And then again, we're all talking like, oh, you live right here? But Oh, you're right here. I'm right here too. And the next thing I know, I'm I'm back at school one day and I'm walking around. I'm near the cafeteria and I see all these dudes walking around, including Punchline, Wordsworth. They were all in my school at the same time, but literally right until that whole meeting happened at the, at the radio station, we didn't all see each other in that same light. We didn't all know we're part of the same community. We're all MCs. So then from there, it just became a thing where it's like, you know, Cryptic One would invite us to his house every Friday. We would go there and just cipher for hours, man. And then it grew into a thing where me and Dynamics Plus, which is Drew Spence, we started lending our pre-production abilities to that. So we would come with pre-recorded segments just because like just freestyling, halfway battling each other, we started becoming boring. So we would come up with these things. We would pull clips from movies and we started doing like a gladiator type of thing before the movie even came out. And we would make it like, you know, let's tag up together to go against this, you know, uh, Gorgon, you know, or a four armed, you know, guy with all these swords and axes and stuff. We would just come up with weird stuff. You know, next week it might be we're all in a world of Terminator, you know, and we're with John Connor and we got it. You know, it was just like super creative. So one week um he tells us he's like yeah man i'm working with this new group they're from harlem um one guy's vast air the other guy's yeah. Wardle. and uh he was like yeah their name is cannibal, cannibal Ox. Ox. So they came yeah. through right and then it started becoming a weird thing where you know all four of us as the lensman would go to his house and as we're sitting here chilling there'd be a knock on the door and all of a sudden you see these feet coming down the steps we're like, who the hell is this? We didn't know this till years later, but he was literally like calling people from different boroughs, like, yo, I need you to come here and battle these dudes. And we're just sitting there <laughs> on some friendly vibe. And yeah. we didn't know what was going on. So these dudes would come through, we're ciphering around, and all of a sudden they throw little jabs at us or throw this, a jab at somebody. And we're like, oh, okay, you want to go there? And then that would just start it. And it just became a huge thing. And um, Cryptic was really supportive. He had a lot of insight on the business end and connections with um, pressing up records. He had connects with Fat Beats and um, a lot of things with shows. That's how, you know, we got on a lot of shows and stuff. And um, we we had no idea things would grow to what they were. But one week in particular, I remember I came there and uh, this one dude was there and his name was Aesop Rock. And I was like, all right, this dude is good. But when it came to like sprint and battling, he... Well, I could tell you, Will, is like, we are the thirstiest, most ravenous, just, I mean, I, I was just brought up in a battle and era, and it's not my favorite thing, mm-hmm. but just go there, just something, of, just something switches, yeah. and I mean, between all four, I mean, again, I don't want to compare us to Wu-Tang, but a lot of people did that on their own anyway, because we would go as a four slash even five man group to Lyricist Lounge, Wetlands, all of these places where underground or slash backpack mm-hmm. rappers would go. Mm-hmm. And after the show's over, we're all in the in the back, just getting it in, siphoning around, battling each other and all this stuff. And we didn't know till years later because we wouldn't frequent these spots, but it was still routine enough to where it was kind of like a stamp left on the mm-hmm. scene. What we didn't know till years later was it was an actual thing called the Legend of the Lensman. And we're like, what the hell is that? And they're like, yeah, it's this story of these four or five dudes that would come from one of the islands. They didn't know if it was Staten Island or Long Island, but these guys would come and just literally shut down a cipher and then leave and never be heard from until like 
a year later or months later. And we didn't really even know about it. And a lot of people were confusing my group with Wu-Tang, actually, because Wu-Tang wouldn't show up 30 deep. They would only show up four or five deep. So uh, it was a lot of comparisons just because um, the uniqueness of each man's style. You know what I mean? It wasn't a group where it's like, oh, they have a very cohesive style. It wasn't like that. It was like right. each man is in his own lane, but it yep. just works. And uh, yeah, man. So that's how I got involved with that whole thing. And it's it's uh, just awesome. a crazy trip, man. If you knew all the stuff that that happened back then, you know, um, one of our first major releases we were on were put out for some dudes in Canada. Um, it was only put out in cassette because CDs weren't a thing yet. We were right on that cusp where people mm -hmm. started getting burners in their own houses right. and stuff. So they released it on C on a cassette. And I'll never forget, I'm looking at the cassette because uh, Vast Air is on there. Really, like, all of his early recordings are considered, like, his best stuff. And, yep. um, you know, dudes kind of lose their way, get a little warded down as time goes on and things like that. So all those recordings, even the record I have with him, those are deemed, like, his best verses. And uh, I remember getting a cassette, and I'm looking at it, trying to see if there's any notable names on here, you know, to add mm -hmm. a little bit of value and credibility to it. Mm -hmm. And at that time, uh, Karis One had put out a group called Channel Live, and their main record was called Smoke Ism, Smoke Madism. All we do is smoke madism, you know. So that was their single, and they were actually on on this album with us. So I'm like, okay, we got a little validation. But all the other artists were unsigned and on the same level, and I'll never forget um, some of the notable names that I thought just stood out, but within months these people were household names so one that was on the album was a group called black eyed peas mm. and we all know what they went on to oh for do. sure they were big underground artists before they hit their 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 big break yeah there you go and then another dude that really stood out to me i said this guy's gonna get a deal they literally spelled his name m the and symbol and M because he was unsigned <laughs> and unknown. And his song on there was I Just Don't Give a F, uh -huh. but it has a totally different beat because he wasn't signed to Dre yet. And for right. months I heard, I'm like, oh, he's signed. Because at, at this junction, you know, I was hearing about Eminem, but more in the rap battle circuit. Yeah. So, like, you know, you had the some, you know, the rap Olympics, you had Scribble yep. Jam, right. things yeah. like that. Right. So we did Scribble Jam one year, M wasn't there that year. Um, but he had a big a beef with the rap Olympics. Olympics. What it was with with cannabis? Was that what who it was against? No, no. The first mm -hmm. one was with um, why is his name on the tip of my tongue? It's another white. Oh, Cage. Cage is from Cage. our state. Yeah, Cage. So is him sick. and Cage were on a bunch it. of Cage albums. Yeah. Right, right. So that's the first. That's the first one. The cannabis thing kind of came a little bit a little later. Later. Yeah, he was signed at that point. Um. So yeah, man. I mean. That's one of the things that blew me away about you. I know you might remember when uh, we were just in like one of the smallest spaces on Twitter one day. I'm in there with my man, Benny Lee. You know, he's been uh, doing spaces recently and you just popped in there. I'm like, what is Will doing in here? <laughs> and uh, Benny, <laughs> Benny was trying to figure out like what Cryptoids is about. He thought you yeah. were like some anonymous random guy with a PFP project on OpenSea. He's like, yeah, dude, I'm in the middle of work and what's your thing all about? And I'm like, yeah. does he realize he's talking to a CEO of a <laughs> company? I don't think so. So I was like, you know, I asked to go up on stage and I'm like trying to salvage the moment. I'm asking you like official questions and stuff. It was just hilarious. And then that that conversation bled into this whole underground hip hop thing. And then you started blowing me away. You're like, yeah, no juggernauts is and this one. And I'm like, what? Yeah. I'm like, well, yeah. so um, I believe you were saying that you even attended some shows back in those days. And stuff. Oh, for sure. Yeah, so, I've been to some Aesop Rock shows. I uh, hold on. Stay here. One second. Let's go. Let's cool. get it. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, we about to get into it. All right, let's see. Yeah, see, I don't I don't just talk the talk. I got stuff to I got stuff to back it up, you know? So this was um oh this was when was this? This was 2000 and had to be 2008, 2009. This is Aesop Rock with uh Rob Sonic 
uh, and DJ Big Wiz, also featuring Blockhead, DJ Signify. Uh, yes. Cage was also on there this you tour. You said Cage, right? <laughs> so uh, yeah. this was a sick tour, and I had it signed by uh, by Aesop Rock and by Blockhead. Nice. As well. so nice. This show was incredible, incredible show. Absolutely. He brought Absolutely. It. And then Absolutely. Um, I've seen Dell a handful of times. One of, just unbelievable, just unbelievable performer. You, you say backpack rappers. It's funny because every time Dell comes out, he's he's coming out with the backpack. You know, it's facts, uh, facts. That's a fact. <laughs> yeah. So I when you said that, uh, I definitely thought of Dell. Um, I saw a Mr. Lift show in Tallahassee. Mr. Lift was amazing. Um, yeah. Who else did it? Who else? Did other good shows that I saw. Um, I did see. So before. You mentioned Company Flow, so Company Flow, uh, you know, LP was in that trio, and LP became the founder of Def Jux, which was the underground right. label that Aesop right. Rock, Mr. Lif, uh, Cannibal Ox, and all the other ones were right. really a part of. Um, right. And then for folks that that might not know who LP is, you might know know him through his recent group, which is Run the Jewels. That's right, with Killer Mike. With Killer Mike. And, you know, I mean, it, it's been awesome to see LP's career take off like that in that sense because yeah. he was like the, the the background. He was a company flow, but then he really got into producer mode. And then he yeah. would like to do a little bit of like verses here and there. But now, I mean, he's just on another level. He's, the run, run the Jewels is freaking amazing. I love Run the Jewels. Um, that was the crazy thing in that era too was my boy cryptic one was the only one producer for cannibal Ox. Mm. so it came kind of as like a shocker for us a that company flow broke up mm -hmm. and then the first group that he signed and and like he would do beats for people in the community and stuff but when he took on cannibal Ox, it was like no i'm fully producing their album and it mm -hmm. was a weird moment because we're all cool but they were kind of like my man cryptic one right. group that that was the only producer they ever really had mm -hmm. so it was kind of like wow he has to let the reins go and we have yet to really see what lb can do when it comes to producing a whole album yeah. like top to bottom for a totally different group and it was so, very, his, his beats were very different at the time they were like synthy exactly. futuristic -y, you know yes. really kind of yes. out there you know out there i got i gotta put you on to our earlier stuff as well too yeah. man um definitely some out there experimental hip-hop yeah. man that's, that's how it was for us because doing the safe and mundane was just not good enough man that was not getting our juices flowing anymore you know we like we, we gotta step outside the it's box funny. well when i saw when i saw you in the vv community and the, just the collector community in general i saw dr strange i'm like i wonder if he does they reminds me of dr octagon you know Dr. Octagon yes. was also one of those real abstract rappers, you know, yes. um, as uh, well. Uh, so the thing, the thing with the group, the Lensman is yeah. a heavy influence for us was ultra magnetic MCs. Mm -hmm. And that one member in our group, his name is Orthodox. Mm -hmm. He was a heavy, he was into said G super heavy. And then the Nanax plus was into cool Keep super heavy. Yeah. And I mean, even when they did that album with Bobito called The Cenobites yeah. with Godfather Don, that was like, oh, this is, you know, to me, that's one of the best, like, eras that Cool Keith rhymed in because he took it serious, but semi serious because he's just Cool Keith. Yeah. But, you know, when you're getting on a track with a lyrical juggernaut like Godfather Don, you got to kind of, you know, match that energy. So I thought between that and the way the production was, they were just releasing these singles, just launching them off, man. It was just a crazy time, crazy era. That 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 stuff really was like a, a portal for me into all these different things. And then you get into like, okay, you, you want to listen to abstract rap because you like the Aesop Rock. You got to listen to Dr. Octagon. And Dr. Octagon was like another level of abstract rap because like half, the, <laughs> like half the time it didn't even rhyme, but your mind was like bending, just listening right. to this stuff. Um, exactly. It was almost like you were going on a journey listening to these yes. albums. That's what I loved about these, these albums were like, they were like movies. They were like audio movies, right. basically, right. right? They told a narrative, they told a story. And then that led me to to, to Deltron 3030, which was Dell oh, yeah. and Dan the Automator's yeah. production. I have that on vinyl in the other room. Might might be probably top 20 greatest album of my entire life. Like it's up there. 
just oh, yeah. now that is the definition of an audio movie Deltron yes. 3030 literally Absolutely. you know set in the year 3030 the intro starts and you know, hit you know, Dan the Automator's beast just absolutely ridiculous, futuristic, and then Dell is just weaving this whole like futuristic world about how the world is set in this you know futuristic wasteland and and all these different things. And for me, yeah. that's when I discovered I'm like hip hop is so much more than what is on the radio than what people are right. listening to. And I got hooked. I'm like, if this is the surface of underground hip hop what else is there and it just makes you want to dig and dig and go. keep going because like it's beautiful it's poetry it's art you know and um right you know i just fell in love with it and and that really became you know core of, of my fandom was was dell and hieroglyphics so much so that you know I, I, he's there behind me on, on nearly every zoom call here um right. and, 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 and and let's get into our convo too as well that was in spaces where i said to you i said well you know, I've been trying to dig into cryptoids a little bit. I said I came across a trailer yeah. and the beat was banging. Yeah. And then you had to what'd you tell me? What'd you tell me? Yeah, so uh that's that's a that's a licensed track from hieroglyphics. So um it, it was a, it was a dope moment for me because uh I always wanted to, you know, license tracks from my favorite artists and you know, never had the means to do so, obviously, but there was this one trailer that we were doing and immediately as i saw the trailer and freddie and the animation team put it together and they're like yo we need some background music for this i'm like oh my god i got the the, the perfect track is just coming to my head and this was a track by hieroglyphics called at the helm and it was so funny because this was my myspace track you know when you had your myspace profile <laughs> uh, they would play yeah. background music so yeah. my my background music was this track at the helm and the whole thing life is a blast when you know what you're doing best to know what you're doing for your life get ruined and that that was in college whenever people would go to my myspace page they'd hear this track for the first time and I, my my hit rate between people visiting my page to message me they go what is that i need to know more about that track and that artist and i, I introduced so many people to dell because of like that you know that first taste of that track so that track has always had a a special place in my heart um and uh, so i was like you know what i'm gonna try to license that track so i go to hieroglyphics website and there's like an info or contact us at hieroglyphics.com and i email it and i said because they were also doing uh crypto and, and web3 and nfts they had hierocoin they were doing like this whole experimentation oh, wow. around so they were like aware wow. of it and hieroglyphics they've all been big video gamers and into like technology and stuff like that so they were really like tuned in so i emailed them i said hey i have this nft project called cryptoys been a huge fan for you know the last like 20 years would love to license the track i'd love to license at the helm and i was like i'm never going to get a response but might as well do it and then like right. within a day I get a response and they're like, yeah, fam, no problem. And it's casual from, from hieroglyphics, oh, like literally, casual. you know, it's a it's a casual yeah. response. And, and he's like, yo, this is my number. And I just called him up. And for me, it's like wow. big fan, oh, you know, man. fan moment. Like, yeah. And casual is just, he's just like a chill guy. He's like, yeah, man, you know, thanks man for supporting bro. Appreciate you. And, uh, he was like, you know, it was almost like, he was like willing to like because he knew i was a fan he's like let me know what works for you from a pricing standpoint you know what i mean so like i threw out a number it was quick you know negotiation and we got it done and and yeah so we're able to uh have that track officially in the cryptoids lore now which is awesome right right and it's cool man because you know me and you were already talking through dms before we ran into each other in that space yeah. and i think I think a lot of things connected for you more as far as where I come from and what yeah. I was into once we had that convo. Like, 100%. you were like, oh, wait, wait. And then I told you, I said, wait, you just wrote a vast there. You might want to go to my Twitter page and see the the, the, the pinned tweet there, you know? And I think things really jump together. 100%. You, know, and, you know? Yeah, that's it. You know, I'll, I'll, you know c collecting at the end of the day, the, the best part about it is is meeting like-minded people right people that you can connect with jam with at the end of the day the values of these things they go up they go down they go sideways we don't even freaking know it but like the best thing about it is you know meeting folks like you meeting folks that you know we can have conversations like this and then just jam and enjoy it and like 
it becomes like the value of these collectibles are all moot points because we're enjoying our lives and chatting about things that make us happy and bring us fulfillment you know so i love that about this community when you when you were going to these shows in manhattan where were you living at the time because i know you, you down in miami mm. were you closer to new york or no so so all these shows were in florida and they would be okay. either in miami or up in tallahassee where i went to, to college yes. so i went to florida state so a lot oh. of these rappers would come through tally because you know college campuses in general where i go is big big spots for them so i saw right. mr Liff like right around the corner from florida state university campus like i was able to walk from campus to the mr lift show he was just insane like you make me want to go back and listen to mr lift because he was just on another oh, yeah. level um and then uh aesop rock was in miami um you know that was after i graduated college by that time aesop rock had already been you know not mainstream yet but right top underground right. you know there's like levels oh, yeah. To underground, oh, yeah. you know? absolutely yeah so, so, he broke so, through he definitely broke through you yeah. know had a couple things going for himself i must sure. say but i was a little dismayed years later and there's a dude from harlem came out asap rocky and i'm like right. Who is that, this that guy? me too yeah what's going on here so you know I had little adjustments to make there but you know i was wondering uh, if that was an homage to asap rock at all or just right. coincidence or whatever i don't, I don't know right um right. well yeah it was all like between miami and uh and tallahassee so it was miami fort lauderdale tally west palm you know they they would at, at some point on their tours they make it down to florida and i would just make sure to go to those those shows right i would i would think that was there's two elements which stop my group from being known to this day as group mm -hmm. that were around and that a lot of people drew inspiration from was a we didn't release too much on vinyl Mm. and you know how back then you had record pools and all these different yeah. things and then you have the collector side of vinyl we really didn't grasp that at the time and sometimes right. when you're the artist themselves you're in such heavy development and creative mode and trying to make things that you're not seeing the bigger business picture or even understanding where things are going or things are transitioning because you're just you know heads down you're just doing your thing that's right i would say that and us not hopping on tours with a lot of dudes like yeah we did you know scribble jam in ohio we did certain things but doing shows we we saw the value in it but then again we were just so in tune with running our own label trying mm -hmm. to get that off the ground and again just trying to make records you know great records um so in hindsight now we see the value in that you know and um that staying power that releasing these things through those different mediums have an effect on until this day but you can't go back and rewrite the past you know all you could do is worry about today and tomorrow so right. you know now we're here um mastering ai and all types of things and uh you know we're going back and making videos for a lot of those uh songs that people know and love that we dropped and you know it's it's a big big part of it is having that visual representation for people to connect to you know connect with so 100 uh, you know that's where we are now and we're now dabbling in the comic book world i gotta you know i think i sent you a couple things on that yeah. um so yeah man you know we're just keeping it moving our creativity is just so expansive that it's like mm -hmm. if we're not doing music it's going into something else that's you right. know and that's what me here you know being a content creator so creators create you can't stop it. <laughs> right it's just yeah. it comes out the pores man you know right. so um so yeah man i'm thinking and i'm hoping one day there'll be a dr strange or lensman cryptoids collab in the same yeah. thing as hyro and i know i gotta i gotta enlighten you to some more things you know let you see where we come from a little more and maybe you'll fall in love with some things on your own there you know i like but, it yeah, man. Oh, we'll make it happen. Absolutely, man. Hey, Cryptoys Ambassador, that's the first step, you know. <laughs> and man, I wanted to say thank you for um, believing in me and um, giving me a shot. You know, it's been an unbelievable experience being with Cryptoys, man. It's it's just amazing, man. You guys, we appreciate uh, it. Something else, something else. Class acts it's so much that people just don't know you know in, in in terms of support um you guys are there for us every day literally 
We and appreciate I don't that. People don't even understand. Yeah, well, thank you, you know? man. I mean, it, you know, we are grateful for you and and all the ambassadors that believe in the project and the entire community that believes in the project. Look, it's you know, we're we're a, a very young company, very new, doing something that's very very different. You know, digital toys are a new concept. You know, like it's it, it's something people got to grasp their head around. You know, the majority of the time and. You know, it's it's really through folks like you and and all the other early believers that are it's allowing the it's allowing us to have a chance in the world to like spread our vision and mission so that we can start talking about what we do. We really believe in what we do. We love what we do. Uh, you know, we come to work every single day creatively on fire. We're really excited about everything that we're doing. We have a lot, you know, right now that's that's cooking and that's about to hit the market. So we're really excited about that. Um, and just grateful, grateful for all your support, grateful for all the content you're putting out, and, and most importantly, the vibes and the energy, because, you know, I think, you know, folks don't realize this, you know, there's a lot of obviously back and forth, not just with cryptoids, but like, you know, VV and HRO and McFarlane and all these different, there's all this like back and forth of, you know, pros and cons and negative stuff and chirping and all this stuff. And I don't think people understand just how hard it is to build these projects and these companies like there's so many things that go into this stuff there's so many approvals that you have to go you know through when you're dealing with big ip like this there's so many uh, things that have to happen every single day for you to even have a chance in bringing product like this out to market and it takes a team that literally doesn't sleep that pushes through that just you know believes in their vision so much that they want to see the reality and to serve the community and um the the sheer amount of of, of things that you know that are that are in front of us that we got to knock out just to bring things to market i don't think people understand you know i i, I feel for the guys at vv because i also see the the, the, the things see. over there and, and i know because I, I work on a, on a project that deals with you know licensed partners, IPs, and all these regulations and all these things. Just how hard it is to even put out a tweet, you know, right. Uh, right. and get that officially approved. You know, just like right. things like that. Like you know, you have to be able to, you know, do it with the proper respect that these IP deserves. You also have investors. You you know raise capital. You have the community. All these things. Um, it's a process. And, you know, we're just grateful for the community that that sticks by us and, and knows that this is a marathon, not a sprint. And, uh, and you know, I think, I, you know, I, I believe that over these next few months, people will really be happy with some of the things they see out of Cryptoids because they're going to see a lot of things start coming to fruition. Oh, yeah. I think uh, 2024. Yeah. Woo! And I mean, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm extremely grateful to be part of the team just because i'm a very visionary type of person and i'm the type that doesn't necessarily look at where things are now or where i see them going so again to be a part of this and be early on the ground floor and be part of a team of people like-minded individuals that want to see this thing grow um when i look at five years from now still being with this company it's it's going to be amazing. That's all I can say, you know, yeah. and um, I'm here for it and I'm here to support it, as you know. And I'm glad that, you know, our conversation's kind of going in this direction because um, it's kind of segueing into a, a question I have for you was before there was a cryptoid, at some point you had a vision to start a company. And then that blossomed into what we see today in Cryptoids. But I want to go back to before Cryptoids started. When did you know that starting this company was what you wanted to do? I want to know, like, how it started. What was was the co-CEO involved early on? Was it a shared vision? Was it just your thing? How did that happen? Yeah, no. So, so this really all started because of my daughter, Victoria, uh, and her love for for these toys, these these surprise unboxing toys called LOL Surprise and Hatchimals and, you know, Disney Dorables and things like that. Basically, the idea is you, you buy these things for 20, 30 bucks. You know, she would open them up inside as a random toy and it'd be chasing the rare ones, just like we chase, you know, specific cards when we open up packs of basketball cards. You know, there's similar things work in toys. So, you know, I had just sold my prior company which was called Live Ninja, you know, and, you know, I was working um, for the company that bought us 
And then also I discovered NFTs through CryptoKitties. Uh, shout outs to Dapper Labs. I fell into that rabbit hole. The whole concept of digital collecting for me was like, made a ton of sense because the idea was I was, a, I was a physical collector all my life, but then I became a video gamer. And the idea that I can kind of blend the two things together, physical collecting, but video gaming is digital collecting to me is that kind of intersection. And I was just like, immediately hooked and then you know my daughter started getting obsessed with these toys and you know what we were talking about was we would buy these things and i was spending hundreds of dollars if not thousands of dollars on these toys she'd open them up and once the novelty wore off of which one she got they would just collect dust in the corner of the room she would never play with them again they'd be like a mountain of plastic so you know her and i were discussing how cool it would be uh if you would be able to take these toys but then do things with them like put them in your ipad right and you'd be able to play different games with them interact with them in different ways and what if the unboxing experience was digital and there'd be special effects and you could do things digitally that you can't do physically and a lot of these ideas really came from her and you know it started off as just this like you know kicking around this idea between a, a father and, and and his daughter uh, and we were just going back and forth having fun just talking about it and, you know, a few weeks later, I brought the idea to uh, my co-founders at Live Ninja for my prior company. And again, we all had full-time jobs, but we loved the idea so much. We decided to spend our nights and weekends, you know, off hours, just like tinkering around with the concept. And very shortly after that, Emilio, my, my co-founder and CTO, uh, said, hey, this, this concept of yours is cool and all. It's the, the stuff that Victoria, my daughter, uh, was, was talking about. But if we really want to take it to the next level, I have just the guy. Uh, his name is Freddie, and he's a 3D artist. I used to work with him back in the day at Disney. And uh, and then Freddie joined the team. He, he got the concept right away from day one, and he started sketching out these 3D characters. Uh, and then it was off into the races. And again, you know, this was in 2018, and this was in the middle of the, the bear market in crypto, you know, from 2018 to, to you know, 2020, it was, 2020, it was pretty, yeah. pretty bare and it started picking back up, oh, yeah. obviously, in 2020. Um, right. Nobody cared about NFTs from 2018 to 2020. And we just had this little side project and everybody had full time jobs. We weren't doing this except for, you know, a few hours at night, but having fun with it. You know, we we're building it for our kids and it was a passion project. And we just started making slow but steady progress, you know, over those couple of years. It wasn't a company and it wasn't a platform with users. It was just like this like thing that we we're really passionate about that we knew deep down inside that there would be a toy of the future and that it would be digital uh, and we wanted to play a role in that and we wanted to build it for our kids and then uh you know obviously the the market turned full in a big way in in late 2020 and you know nfts were all the rage and you know we had this concept that we've been working on for a couple of years so we already had like a prototype ready to go and uh, and we were just so excited about the that people were starting to pay attention to NFTs because we had believed in it for for a few years prior, and then uh, you know shortly after that you know we we decided well, let's do this thing full time and JT uh, you know you know joined the company at that point and we co-founded OnChain Studios which was the parent company that we could then house the Cryptoys project, and then we all quit now, our job. Who, who had <clears throat> not to cut you off, but who had the business knowledge and acumen to understand the different moving parts that would need to be put in place to make this a real thing. Like who, who was the one that had the vision? Like, okay, if the company is cryptoids, we need on-chain studios above that. And who really understood how to develop this on the business side? Well, I mean, this is not our first rodeo. So we, we did, live ninja before this one you know that was our pr prior company at which we had you know founded you know formed raised capital hired a number of employees you know so you know sold products to fortune 500 companies you know we had worked with apple we had worked with you know samsung hp we had some big customers that we were you know licensing our product out to um and you know, we sold that company. So we already had like kind of a, you know, some experience. Yeah, right. we had the foundation and we, we knew what it was like to take a company from zero to, you know, zero to one, you know, start it, get it funded, get customers, sell it, okay. you know, and then, and then sell the, the, the business that it would acquire. So when Cryptoys started to get a little bit of traction, 
we had started building this technology, but we also knew that there would be other opportunities on top of it that you'd build the technology for cryptoys, but then you want to keep it flexible in case there are other things you want to do. If there's other products that you build for cryptoys that you could then spin out and get the company additional capital or revenue with. So it was always a good idea from a, a formation standpoint to have a parent company and then crypto is right. underneath it. We did similar things right. at, at Live Ninja and it worked out well with like sub products. We had a sub product called Katana, which is like a B2B. So we had Live Ninja and then Katana as a sub product. But even though all of our focus is cryptoids and it is the main focus of the company, it's good structurally to keep that, that flexibility for a number of reasons. So, Absolutely. you know, we decided, you know, very shortly after JT joined and JT really helped with the formation of it to, uh, to you know, you know, form uh, form on chain studios and then roll cryptoids underneath it so that we could really get the, the the proper structure in place for that. Yeah, I'm trying to ask these questions just because you know how the creativity is through the roof with us guys, you know what I mean? But we do lack the experience on the business end, and it's kind of hard to really penetrate it properly when you don't have a point of reference or a mentor mm -hmm. or someone within a circle with that experience. Um, and as an artist, that's all you know is totally. artist creating. So that's the whole thing is um, now that we're older, we're understanding the importance of business. But again, it's that um, we don't have too many points of reference. Right. So um, I guess that's where, you know, these questions kind of spawn from. And I'd, I'd like to give that. Um, you know, bit of information out there for other people that do have visions and are in the same kind of boat, you know, where they have great ideas, but they don't know where to even start, you know? They're great questions. And, and, and the only way that I was able to learn this stuff is by asking questions myself. And I think a lot of people, you know, just like you just did, like give themselves permission to ask all the questions, like, and, and the, the great thing about it, and it's kind of like a, an important secret that a lot of people should know is that, there, you know, I learned this stuff through mentors of mine who are, you know, much more successful than I am. And the secret is all these really busy people, these successful people, they want to mentor other people. They want to pay it forward. They actually want to meet for coffee and share with, the, you know, young aspiring entrepreneurs uh, how, how they, you know, how to do certain things. Cause you know what, they were in that position too. And some guy took, you know, some, some guy or, 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 or woman took that phone call and gave them a shot early on. Right. So they always want to pay it forward to remember, Hey, someone took a shot on me. I want to take a shot on someone else. And, you know, I, I, I try my best, you know, even, you know, with the schedule that I have to make time for coffees, for, you know, conversations like this, for calls and, try to fit in where I can because, you know, you got to pay it forward, you know, and you, you never know one phone call or one piece of advice can change someone's life and, and, and hopefully for the better. Right. So. right. I mean, um, with that said, I think I need to be in your DMS a little more often. Man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, absolutely, man. You know, I'm, you know, we, we, we go back almost a half a year now, Will, at this yeah. point, you know, it's been a We're while, but it's like you said, we're just getting started, baby. And that's what I mean. It's like, you know, I got a lot more to share with you, see what you think. Um, and, and part of it, like you said, is, is just asking questions. But the part that a lot of people struggle with is they don't even know what questions they should be mm -hmm. asking sometimes. And, you know, um, that one question being answered could open up so many things. But again, you, don't, you only know what you know. Mm hmm. You know, and um, you can only perceive that which you have an inkling of even existing. You know, you're like, OK. And some That's of these true. things, they they just come, you know, your way as you just get started. Sometimes mm -hmm. um, you don't want to have a, what do they call it? Paralysis due to a net too much analysis. You know what That's I right. mean? And um, I found myself doing that, making excuses to start a channel because I didn't have equipment or this, that and the third. And. I just had to strip all that away and just say, look, if this is something you want to do, find a way. So I said, you know, one consistent thing I'm pretty sure I always have in my life is a phone. Mm. I don't know if I always have a powerful laptop. I don't know if I have a decent background or a microphone, but I know I have the phone. So I just made it my mission to figure out how to make content through the phone, editing everything I do. That's where it all starts. And then, you know, now it's grown into to what it is. 
and I feel like I'm just getting started still, like you said, it. you know. Yeah, and 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 you know, I would encourage folks to to just get started, you know, because like you said, you don't know the questions to ask sometimes, and sometimes you just got to start doing, and then you get to chapter, you know, you start by reading chapter one, you get to chapter two, and then you know, oh my God, I don't know how to do this. Then the question pops up, but you have to get to chapter two to even know to ask the question, right? So, like, there you, you know, go. The, the other analogy is like, a, you know, the, we just got this house here. Like, I wouldn't even know what this house needed until I got into the house, right? So, like, I can't like not walk into the house and be like, it's going to need this, it's going to need that. I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do that. I don't know how right. things about how to do, you know, do certain property management and upgrades. But you know, you get in. On day one, you're figuring things out, you're figuring the layout, and then you realize, oh, the bathroom needs to be remodeled. And then right. you're like, wait a second, I've never remodeled a bathroom before. So then you start right. researching, how do I remodel a bathroom? And then you talk about, oh, there's plumbing involved. So what do I need to do with the plumbing? Oh, and there's retiling. What does retiling right. mean? And you start losing, right. how do I do retiling? And it's just like, like all these and all this stuff. Right. All this stuff right? And like, you wouldn't think about that before you walked into the house. But as you start going project by project, the questions come naturally. So sometimes just give yourself permission to start, get going. And as you go, don't be afraid to ask the questions as they come up. Write the questions down ask somebody if they know the answer and if they don't know the answer say do you know anybody else that could help me with that and then okay. like, that's how all this stuff really comes together and the, the the other benefit is you're getting answers to those questions and networking at the same time and meeting people so it's kind of like a two for one who can answer this question oh let me introduce you to so and so here's an introduction so you're networking then you actually get to the person that can actually help you so that's right you know that's right. massive benefit yeah man um Man, so we're about to hit 2024. Gonna ask somewhat of a generic question. In 2024, in terms of marketing and bringing in new users, what can we expect from Cryptoids? A lot. So, you know, we have our mobile app that's coming out, you know, pretty soon. Mm -hmm. In the mobile app, there's going to be like different forms of interactivity, not just the AR experience, which is coming, but also different, you know, mini games. And I think the mini games is really going to allow us to open up our marketing efforts towards the gaming uh, community. Right now, all we've really been able to do is market towards digital collectors. And that's really been what's resonating is, is digital collecting marketing. And as much as, you know, we love the digital collecting community, right now it's a little bit limited, right? You know, like there's only a certain yes. market for people that are into digital collecting. So each right. one of these projects, whether it's us or VV or HRO, McFarland, Dapper, et cetera, we all need to play our part in helping the space branch out. And for us, we really want to market into the, the gaming community and the gaming ecosystem. So once we have those games, which we should have here over the next few months, we're then going to invest a lot of time and money into marketing, partnering with Twitch streamers, more gaming YouTubers, mm -hmm. things like that, mm -hmm. to get exposure to the Cryptoys platform. We also plan on marketing in Roblox uh, and different things mm -hmm. like that. So spreading the name through, through those kind of platforms. Additionally, mm -hmm. on top of that, we also have our Guardian Controls uh, feature that's yes. coming out. Guardian yeah. Controls will allow us to finally market in a compliant way to kids under the age of 12, which is obviously the fastest growing segment in the Roblox community and Minecraft and Fortnite. So we think that's a really, really important segment to be able to market to and to provide our, our types of products to. So we're really excited about that. Um, you know, my son asked me all the time. My son is nine. He's like, Dad, you know, when am I going to be able to officially join Cryptoys? And I'm like, soon, it's coming. So I kind of mm -hmm. also making the feature for my kids as well, which I'm excited right. about. Um, so I think just those two things open up a ton of possibility from a marketing Excuse standpoint. You. And also the mobile app will be there too. So like you can have Cryptoys in your pocket wherever you go. So really excited about, you know, those, those features coming to market because it opens up a whole new world for us. Right, right. And you just use that word market. But we all know the marketplace is high on your list of priorities. No need to really even go there and beat that drum. So we have to have it. I mean, there's just no way yeah. we can't, you know, not ship that in, in, in a timely fashion. The biggest thing for us is, and I don't think a lot of people realize this, like every time, you know, we talk about our feature development, I've mentioned it on, on podcasts, I've mentioned it on Twitter spaces. Th this 
platform, Cryptoys, we actually were held back for about nine months due to some old legacy code that we had had that actually stopped us from developing rapidly on the platform. And we actually had to like stop for a second wow. and actually like bite the bullet and rewrite a lot of like foundational legacy code. But you got too far along. Exactly. To actually be yeah. able to now jump forward. So a lot of folks, they look at the, they're like, oh, you know, you should have been making things faster. They don't even understand what's underneath the hood that we had to no. do and like rip out the engine and put a new one in. <laughs> well, we right. did. We did. We had to do it. We bit the bullet and now it's there and yeah. it's a lot faster and it's a lot smoother. We're now able to ship things a lot quicker. So you're, yes. you're, you guys are going to see here over these next like, six months, there's going to be so many features that are going to be coming out. It's going to be a whole new platform and company. Uh, really, really excited about it. Marketplace is high on the list, not just a native marketplace so that people can mm -hmm. transact in Toykin, which is our virtual currency, kind of like Rob Robux mm -hmm. and V-Bucks, but also mm -hmm. third-party marketplace support. So you can take your crypto toys uh, and actually, you know, use a third-party marketplace with it as well and, you know, fiat and that kind now, of stuff. Yeah. Now, when it comes to doing something like that, are the other IPs, uh, on the same page with that, or is that something that would be with um, just UFOs and your particular IP? That's, that why, that's why we're doing both in parallel, and we're working with every single one of our partners to, to, to get as much approved as possible. But we have to have flexibility, so that's why we're doing two marketplaces in parallel, you know, because we do have a number of partners. We have a growing number of partners, um, and everybody has different rules and regulations. And again, it's one of the things that I wish, like, you know, more people can understand. And again, I don't, I don't fault anybody. Like, you know, this is, you have to be in it to be in it, you know, and, and really working with these companies and things like that. But um, if you want to be in the business of licensed digital collectibles and collect your favorite characters of all time, uh, these iconic characters, there's an arena that you have to play in. It's not for Wild right. Wild West. It's not like, you know, that you can just do whatever you want. So there's certain trade-offs. And again, I have so much empathy for my fellow uh, companies in the space. Again, VV and McFarland and all that, because I know just how hard it is and how, um, you know, like what we sign up for is, we, you know, we have to sign up for building certain things in an organized fashion with great partners uh, on board. And our partners are fantastic. They're, they're su super supportive. They believe in the space wholeheartedly. But you can't just say, here's self-custody, do whatever you want with it. And then here's this, do whatever you want. And like, check this out, dude, like, the, oh yeah, and crypto and all this. Like, you can't do that in a licensed world. And it's, and, 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 and there are partners that are fully on board with every single feature. And then there are partners that are on board with, with five out of the seven. And then there's another partner that's on board with three out of the seven. And like, right. we gotta navigate this. Be flexible. Yeah, yeah, be, be flexible, right. but you also and, and have to navigate it professionally. So um, right. I think again, it's a marathon, not a sprint, but I, I, I think right. everybody's gonna be very excited where, you know, all these platforms, not just us, but all these other pl platforms in the space take things over the next few years. So I'm, I'm very optimistic. I, I agree, I agree. I know you have a, nice little decent vv collection and yeah. you know you like me man you just like collecting you know yeah. um, as long as it's good quality and it's on par with the ip and it's looking and sounding how it should yeah i kind of want it you know exactly i'm with you so are there um any more upgrades or changes coming uh to the desktop version as far as the unit your know, user interface aspect so I say with the desktop, like, and we are going more mobile. So I would say there's gonna be a lot of features. Like mobile's a big emphasis for us. Like desktop, there's there's new versions of the block, different scenes and stuff that you can interact with and run around with your character. So that is coming. Um, but I, I think a lot of the features you're gonna, you're gonna start seeing uh, more uh, with a mobile emphasis uh, because again, that's where we see the majority of our usage. People are taking their their, their collections on the go and they want to do unique things with them. Mobile gaming is a big part of what we're trying to do and, you know, uh, make an emphasis on as part of the platform. So um, I think you'll see a lot more emphasis on mobile, but also, of course, as we build things for mobile, we'll build things for desktop too in parallel. Okay, nice, nice. Yeah, that was um, definitely something that blew my mind away one day. I logged into Twitter, saw one of the zoophobes walking around in AR and 
saw a little, totally. little uh, control function. I was like, oh boy, it's about to be on, man. So I'm guessing that this is all leading to a situation where when it comes to the block, people are going to be able to go on their mobile and and uh, be able to enjoy the block. And, and Yeah, we um, want to support both platforms, but we, we do have a big emphasis for mobile and making sure you can do different things with them, you know, right from your pocket. It's going to be awesome, man. Um, I know I saw a, uh, a mobile, some type of mobile game you guys had um, at some point. Um, can you give us a little lowdown on what that's about? Yeah, totally. So that's our first game called Zoofo Escape. Um, and that's, uh, you know, a mobile game that's going to be launched from within the Cryptoys uh, mobile application. So you'll be able to launch that and, uh, and then play with the, uh, you know, select Cryptoys within that, 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 that mobile app. So within the mobile app, we have these experiences, we call them Cryptoys experiences. And the first two experiences you're going to be able to do is the first game, Zoofo Escape and the AR camera. So you'll be able to see your wow. Cryptoys in, in real time. So very excited. Wow. About so do you have a vision to where all of the ips would allow their characters to be interacted with that same way or is it a situation where it's like you know for sure what you can do with your own ip yeah. but other people are kind of like on a wait and see basis or is there, it just across the board yeah there are certain partners that you know, give us a green light on certain things right off the bat. And then there are other partners that need to take a phased approach to it. And that's one of the, the reasons we have our own IP is that we should do whatever we want with that. And then our partners can see, okay, that's cool. Fine. You know, customers like that, you know, it, it, it makes sense and that'll be a fast follow. So it might not be approved at launch, but it might be approved, you know, a certain amount of time right. later. So right. um, again, each partner, when you're dealing with licensed IP, everyone has different comfort levels. Some will green light it right at launch and some will be a faster follow later on. So one of the things that I found out early on about you guys that really made me look at you in a different light was I think there was like a story where you guys attended some convention, I guess, where new startups like yourself are there trying to pitch your idea to the bigger IPs and brands out there. And um, there was somewhat of a just it just clicked between you and Mattel. You know, you guys are trying to make digital toys. They are one of the biggest, most nostalgic companies when it comes to making mm -hmm. toys. Just seemed like a perfect match made in heaven. And when I found out that they actually um, invested, that was something that kind of blew my head open and was like, oh, boy, I got to take these guys serious. What is going on over here? So how did that whole thing happen? If you can give us a quick rundown on that. Yeah, we were we were connected with Mattel through a mutual connection, um, mm -hmm. you know, a, a, connect, a connection that knew us and also knew them and said, hey, you know, what you guys are doing definitely makes sense to talk um so we connected with them and we were very fortunate because this was in a time where you know there was a lot of interest in, in nfts and, and digital collectibles and we had interest from nearly every major toy company um most of the household names that you know about we were in conversation with and we got very um uh, you know it, we got very familiar very quickly with each company and the different approaches and the way they were thinking about the space and the way they were thinking of the future of toys. And it was just clear right off the bat after we talked with all the companies that Mattel was the one that thought like us the most. Like they were just like so in line with where the future of, of toys are going, what the future of play looks like. Um, and there was just so much energy on those calls. You know, sometimes you get on calls with people and they're like, they're there to do their due diligence and they're there to investigate and they're there to like, right. mm, okay, what do you think about this? And this, blah, blah, blah. and the, but Mattel was like, what are you guys working on? Oh my God, this is exciting. Like, what, what are you thinking about <laughs> three months from now? And like, how would you do this? And like, how could you take, you know, you know, what would you do with this property? And how would you do this property? And like, you know, we had this idea for X and you had this idea for Y. What if we put them together? Like there was just so much like offensive oh, wow. energy that we're like, wow. This is our partner for sure. We just knew <laughs> right. we just knew it. So right. you know, and, and then immediately they were the first company to say, "Hey, I know we're talking about licensed 
like taking our properties and licensing them, but can we also invest in the company? And I'm like, yes, wow. absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> right. They were also like taking it a step further and they were showing they were serious about it. So that also made me, you know, really excited to work with them. They wanted to put their money where their mouth was and not just kind of do a test to see where it went, you know? Right. Can you speak to any plans to add utility by way of airdrops, kind of like, you know, we're stepping into with Yoda, but maybe mm -hmm. something scaled down as far as like not needing such an intensive set to complete in order to receive an airdrop, like maybe holders of different soft sets could get airdropped a variant of their weapon or costume. Oh yeah, so there's a lot of ideas. Well, I got a lot of ideas. The creative juices are crazy. I love, I love it. So th there's a lot. There's a lot that's coming, um, uh, and lots of stuff on that front. You know, we want to continually reward customers. We want to reward holders with different things. So yes, that all I can say is yes. Um, yes. Okay. You know, and we're we're constantly listening to feedback, constantly learning, constantly improving. So we got we got lots planned lots of things that we want to give as airdrops lots of bonuses lots of uh you know fun things in the works you know so that's dope man yep. so you know via my content a lot of people know me for being a comic collector loving to cover you know all things in the comic sphere especially on the digital side of things so first i gotta say congratulations for dropping the masses of the universe comic that was Thanks, um, Unbelievable, came out of nowhere, smacked us in the face. Uh, <laughs> awesome drop. I love the way you rolled it out. But can we look forward to more comics, either from Motu or either from other IPs or independent artists? Where do you guys see yourself going? Um, yeah, comics? yeah. You know, I think we want to do more comics. We want to do more, you know, more unique forms of content. I think that's the cool thing about crypt toys is, you know, we're a digital toy company and a, and a toy company can produce lots of different toys, you know, and lots of different things that you can collect and interact with, whether that's book form, whether that's action figure form, whether that's puzzle form, uh, there's lots you can do. So, you know, we want to continue to push forward. You know, it was, it was great to see the Motu comic be so well received. It was awesome okay. working with our friends at Mattel on that because Mattel gave us full permission to intersect the IP, to take our characters yeah, and their so characters sick. and just like, you know, intersect so it, which is amazing. And yeah. what an honor that we get to do that. Um, yes. So, yeah, just the beginning there. We want to do, you know, tons more on that front. Continue the story. I love it, man. Um yeah, that, that thing just literally came out of nowhere and just blew me away. Like, I wasn't expecting that. And uh, you guys pulled it off, you know, smooth, nice. I would say I have one little gripe is being yeah. an avid comic book collector. My only gripe was the placement of the autos. As a mm. comic book collector, autograph placement is huge. So when mm. I met up with Steph, when she came to New York, I let her know. I said, man, I don't... You know, I know Josh is on board. I say, hey, but if you need another consultant that knows <laughs> comics, you already got an ambassador on board, man. Just that. check what you like, you know. But um, that that would be the only thing I would have changed about the covers. But I like, you know, the variants you guys offered, um, all those little tweaks to each, you know, rarity and stuff like that. So no complaints there, man. I just I just didn't expect to open it and see you guys execute it the way you did when you smashed both the universes together like that like again appreciate side it. swiped out of nowhere i'm like oh this is crazy <laughs> because my bandmate drew spence you know when he does these comics like you know at one point he was in talks with marvel he was doing a version of spider-man and this is before you know the whole spider-verse thing and all of this stuff so he basically has his he has so many books and so many characters so many different story arcs i mean once you dive into where we are lyrically, you'll get an idea of like how expansive and how crazy this dude is. And I think you'll be able to tap in with him um, just because like you're into high, high conceptual, high lyrical rap and hip hop. Mm -hmm. And that's really where we come from. So, I mean, when it comes to storytelling, and book writing, I mean, I have to give it to my man. He's he's unbelievable. And um, he has some things on the table with Marvel. But at this point, um, 
he's really looking to just do his own thing. You know what I mean? So he's out here publishing books, bringing them to physical reality. So with that said, you know, even back to the airdrops or even not, um, what I would like to see is Mattel and you guys collaborate um, on different levels to bring things into the physical world as well. You know, mm -hmm. from ZFOs, I, I would love to have a little furry ZFO I can have right here on my lap while I'm on stream, you know. So any plans to bring some, some, oh boy, here we go. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. So any plans to bring something like that to market? Yeah, we're working hard on, on physicals for sure. Um, definitely, as you can see, we have a lot of prototypes. A lot of folks sending us some cool unique things um and we're pushing forward on a few of them so so hopefully here in the next few months you'll see the first crypto physicals come through oh nice nice yeah. nice another thing i would like to see um which was mind-blowing when i was hanging out with steph was uh the promotional comic-con items that uh um, yeah you know we picked up and brought out you know you had the ZFO t-shirts, crypto stickers, you know, mm -hmm. I was able to give some of this stuff away um during during raffles that I held, but man, people got a they got a little bit of a uh feverish fervor for this stuff, nice. man. So I'm trying to see like do I got to get the merch division popping what's going on, man? Uh, yeah, happy to see that. Yeah, we got to figure that out. That's pretty, you know, about all of that. I, I know. I know. We definitely have to push forward on that. And I think 2024 you'll see a lot more merch, you know, for sure come yeah. to uh to the market we got a lot of a lot planned on that front it was always big like we wanted to make sure they were nice quality and and and, and you know we didn't want to put out anything that was cheap but right. you know from a quality standpoint so you know we, we've done some checks and you know there'll be some cool stuff i think hitting the market pretty soon all right dope man dope man so yeah man had you on almost two hours now man so it's getting pretty late here on the uh east coast so man I, I just really appreciate you coming through long time coming hopefully many more of these to come more, hang out on sure. the block with your boy absolutely man so i don't know any parting words for the people just grateful for you all grateful for all your viewers grateful for this community grateful for you strange like again thank you for all your support and everything you've been doing man it's been it's been awesome working with you getting to know you and like i said before this is just the beginning lots more to come on this front i enjoyed this was an awesome just conversation just like sitting and and jamming with you it was like having like a virtual cigar you know right uh, <laughs> I love we gotta it. make that happen in real life too you know yes, we do. Get yes we, 100 yeah. percent um but yeah man thank you so much and thank you if, if you're watching this you know thank you so much for tuning in and spending some time with strange and i you know just just jamming over here so we appreciate you tuning in and for spending your time with us and and thank you for all your support so you know for for all of, of you who are tuning in watching or listening thank you yeah man thank you guys and one last part in question man i just gotta make sure you're not pulling a david you um <laughs> Those things, I see, I see a little bit of Mandalorian. I see a little. You're not dropping any hints, right? With with the stuff in the background, right? Just, you're not. I I am so barred from saying anything, <laughs> yay or nay. I just I love I, I love what I love. I love right. Star Wars, and right. uh, I guess like that's all I could say. I love Mando. Um, yeah. I bought, this, I bought this with my own money because I love the Mandalorian. Right. I uh, just like yeah. I love the dolphins. You know what I mean? So oh, that's what they can say on the front. I'm telling you, man. So yeah, man. <clears throat> we got a lot of beautiful things to look forward yeah. to in the near future. And I'm excited for it. I'm here for it. And um, yeah, man, I love being a part of this project, whether I am an ambassador or not, you know. Um, I just gravitated towards it day one, which went on uh my boy OG Vault's channel and you know, brought it to the whole community. I was just like, man, there's something different about this this going on here. And the more I dove in, the more I liked. And uh here we are today, man, collaborating on this level. And like you said, it's just the beginning, no telling where it's gonna go. But man, let's get it, man. 2024 is almost here. I'm excited for this next quarter. And um, yeah, man, I really appreciate you coming through, man. So thank you for coming through and hanging out on the block with me. Of course, man. Thank you for having me. It's been a blast and let's do it again soon. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So till next time, ladies and gentlemen, your man, Dr. Strange, 
Your man will catch you next time.